Uvi Omo Agege. I represent Delta Central Central District. Mr. President, first, like I did earlier on today, I'd like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to Mr. President for this great nomination. I also want to extend my congratulations to my brother, the nominee, my constituent. Mr. President, Senator James Manager will speak for my caucus. But before he does that, as a senator representing my thought I should put in a few words. I rise today, Mr. President, as the first defense witness to corroborate everything he has told the Senate today. Mr. President, this is one nomination that will add value to the Federal Executive Council, headed by Mr. President. Mr. President, I know Festus Kayamo is a very decent man. He is a great ambassador of my people, the Robo Nation, that I have the privilege to represent here. He is also a great ambassador for my state. Mr. President, in his practice of law, he has left his imprints, footprints, in the sounds of time. There is no area of the law where you will not see Kiyamo's landmark uh, contributions. Yes. But I will say that, Mr. President, I just have uh, a couple of questions for him. Or do I call him consent? For want of a better expression. Mr. Kiyamo, as a lawyer of so many years and a senior advocate of Nigeria, you've traversed most of our courts, with the high court of the state, the federal high court, the court of appeal, and indeed the Supreme Court. You know, for want of a better expression, you know where the bodies are buried. I want to ask you, what major reforms would you want to see in the justice sector, having practiced for so many years? Then number two, we've had so many issues, so many concerns expressed by well many Nigerians about the saturation of uh, the ballot paper with so many political parties, mushroom political parties that ordinarily should not even exist. But because of the provisions of Section 222 of the Constitution, to the extent that INEC adjudges you to have made the requirements for registration of political party, you are registered and placed on the ballot. For those of us who watched the, uh, who participated in these last uh, uh, general elections, I think about 74 or there about political parties participated in the elections and were all listed in the ballot papers. The game now is to struggle to have your name begin with uh, A, A, A or something so you can be at the very top because it becomes easy for you to, to ah, with your apologies, I thought, uh, 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 Senator Richards was here. You know, there's now a battle, a running battle to, to have. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> to have your name right there eh, at the very top of the ballot. 
So that's the only way you can pretty much stand out, you know, in the midst of uh, 70 to 80 political parties. People are not happy about this. When you go, some people have made the argument that INEC, plus one the provisions of the Electoral Act, have the power to deregister political parties who do not otherwise uh, perform well in the election. But some of us, we think otherwise because of uh, the provisions of the Section 212 of the Constitution uh, that may require some constitutional amendment. I'd like you to share your thoughts on this as a good and versatile legal petitioner. Uh, with this, uh, Mr. President and my colleagues, I'm not going to say you should take a bar and go. I won't do that. It's a good product. But in, in, the, in the event you decide to extend that courtesy, I will also welcome it. Thank you very much. Festus Kayam, he knows he's my friend. We have done some battles together. And I'm very, very uh, reassured by the words of the Deputy Senate President that says that you are a good product and we can ask you any question. Which means that you know the law inside out. The Constitution in the fifth schedule, section 11, defines the duties of the code of conduct. of public officers yet yet there is a committee going around usurping the functions of the code of conduct bureau called the obla committee the uh, presidential uh, committee on Asset Recovery. Tell us and tell Nigerians as a promoter and a defender of the law that you have said, why you have not defended all these people that have been illegally asked by a committee to come and give asset accounts or uh, whatever to them because that committee is not in this constitution. And I know you will do justice to this. I will run into. Let me start with the question asked by distinguished Senator Ovie Omoagege. The first question was the major reforms that I would like to see in the justice sector. We all agree that our justice sector has been beset by so many problems. And so I think we, we don't doubt that at all. But then, let me say that I'll be prepared to serve in any capacity that the president wants me to serve. But if I'm AGF, I have I have what the idea I, ha I call the three Ds that would be at the heart of judicial reforms. The three Ds. And the first D is the decongestion of the Supreme Court. The second one would be the decongestion of the prisons. And the third one would be the decongestion of cost lists in courts across the country. And that is, cost, of course, uh, linked directly to speedy trials. Now, as to the decongestion of the Supreme Court, I would not occupy the office of AGF for four years without unbundling the Supreme Court. That would be my first task, to unbundle the Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court is the busiest Supreme Court in the world. And it's just not acceptable. The kinds of cases that go up to our Supreme Court are scandalous. Interlocutory appeals. Appeals dealing with, you know, frivolous matters. And I think this country is big enough now to have six regional Supreme Courts where appeals coming from those regions would end there in land matters, contract matters, marriage, and all of that. 
I mean, as the Supreme Court is designed today, you won't believe, distinguished senators, that a, a, a case of assault, I slap you, you slap me, will go up to the Supreme Court and be lining up with constitutional matters and political matters to be heard. That is scandalous. And that is why today, the cases at the Supreme Court are pending there for the last 15 to 10 to 15 years. Justice delayed is justice denied. The diary of the Supreme Court I speak with you now is filled up to 2022. You cannot get a date at the Supreme Court now till 2022. Yes, now, except political cases. And the political cases are compounding the issues again. So, I don't know why it has not been possible to simply establish regional Supreme Courts. And so the Supreme Court in Abuja would only, would only entertain constitutional matters. Political matters and election disputes. Matters that have to do with that have to do with the interpretation of the constitution because at that point you need the central Supreme Court to guide the entire Supreme Court across the country. And even at that point, in matters of constitutional interpretation, distinguished senators, it is scandalous also for a Supreme Court that has 21 justices, for seven of them to sit to bind others. Because the Supreme Court, by the principles of stare decisis, is bound by its own decisions. So if you have a constitutional matter going to the Supreme Court now, seven justices sit, four can overrule three. So you have four justices giving their opinion on a very serious matter, binding 17 others who have, who have no, no opportunity to contribute to that judgment. And tomorrow, if those 17 others come, or part of those 17 others, and they want to determine that same matter, they will be bound by that decision, even if they have a separate view about it. It's scandalous. So there's something wrong about that system. In constitutional matters, I would press for constitutional amendment to make all the 21 justice seats. Because that's our ground norm. The constitution is our ground norm. So four people cannot determine our ground norm. Where 21 are there. And then we're all bound by that. These are things that are wrong with our Supreme Court. So I will, I, will, I will make a holistic unbundling of the Supreme Court and complete restructuring of the Supreme Court. Again, they have very scandalous applications. You see, there are, there are things we borrowed from Britain that are still bogging us down in terms of delay of cases. For example, the provision in the Constitution of leave to appeal. It is there in the Constitution that you must seek leave to appeal in certain matters. Over time, leave has been granted as a matter of course. But for you, before you appeal, a matter where you have, you have judgment against you, instead of you just having the right to appeal directly, you will first file a motion for leave to appeal. That motion for leave to appeal is pending for five years. For you to just seek a permission to appeal. I mean, why? Why? Do we still allow these antiquarian laws in our constitution? And these are things borrowed from Britain. It's only in exceptional cases they deny you leave to appeal now. Remove all provisions regarding leave to appeal. Let everybody have a right to appeal. Except, of course, the time to appeal, you can seek for extension of time. There should be time limit. But leave to appeal is antiquarian. Remove it from the constitution. Everybody should appeal as a matter of right. And so you can unbundle the Supreme Court with all of this. The congestion of prisons, which is the second day, is that we are not complying with provisions of the law. I want to pay tribute to the Seventh Assembly that passed the Admission of Criminal Justice Act. If you look at the provisions of the Admission of Criminal Justice Act, provisions have been made there, adequate provisions, to address the congestions of our cells and our prisons. For instance, every police station in every part of this country should open its cell to the nearest magistrate court at regular intervals for the magistrate to just come and say, open your cell, I want to see who are those you are detaining here and why you are detaining them. The provision is there. The DPOs are supposed to make returns to the magistrate. So say, look, we have arrested this person, we are detaining them for this reason, and all and all. They are not complying with those provisions right now. Nobody's complying with those provisions. There are adequate provisions there. But the Administration of Criminal Justice Act is only applicable to federal courts because it's the National Assembly that passed it. Federal courts in Abuja, and all of that. Now, it's only a few states that have adopted the Administration of Criminal Justice Act. I think Kogi and some other states. One or two other states. Now, for states that have not adopted the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, 
the scandalous situation we see now is that a person is arrested on a frivolous charge, you know, arraigned in court on a supposedly capital offense. Once, once the magistrate calls his murder, armed robbery, even without a proof of evidence attached, they just say remand. We must amend the law and encourage state government, state governments across the country to amend their criminal procedure acts or codes to ensure that at the point the magistrate is entertaining the charge against those accused persons, instead of sending them to remand, the magistrate should have powers to call for proof of evidence at that stage. Don't tell me that you want to take the fight to DPP for advice. I want to see whether you have proof of evidence. If you don't have proof of evidence, even if I see murder, I will release him on bail. If I don't see any proof of evidence attached. Because, with apologies to the police, you, they arrest people on the road. And because you don't have 5,000 for bail, the next day they just type armed robbery and, and take you to court and remand. And the person starts a journey of six years in the prison without bail. That file will be sent to DPP maybe two years later. The person is still waiting. The DPP gets the file, the DPP keeps the file for another four years. It's not attending to the file. Because of our corrupt system, if you've got a corrupt DPP, unless, you come and, unless the person has a person, somebody or people to come and push that file, that file will never leave there for him to give his advice when there's no charge, no evidence against that person. And so our prisons are full of these awaiting advice people. They are full. How can we avoid this? Let us give the magistrates power to grant bail in respect of capital, so-called capital offenses, if there's no proof of evidence at that stage. And then, even the, that, that, I've got, that if all, of course, links to the question that my, my very good friend Dino Malai asked about the powers of the DPP and the Attorney General that are subject to, can be subject to abuse. I think it is high time we amend the law to make the advice of the Attorney General and DPP subject to judicial review. It's high time. The Attorney General and the DPP cannot sit down in their office and exercise the judicial function and say you have no case to answer. The, the, the powers were put there to protect, of course, people who will be charged, you know, with frivolous offenses. That's why they put the power there, so that the DPP can say, don't face trial because it will be frivolous. But on the other hand, it is subject to abuse where people who are actually guilty are freed by the DPP by advice. So we should, and to answer Dino Melaya's question, Senator, distinguished Senator Dino Melaya, that's section 174. Without indicting my very good friend Malami, because I know he's a gentleman, he wouldn't withdraw any charge if he did not see the fact that there's no offense there. And I, I, I can vouch for him. If there's any case like that, Malami must have seen that there was no case. I can vouch for Malami in my sleep. He's a, he's a distinguished colleague. But there are other attorneys general across the states who we don't know, who can exercise and abuse this power. And so, if the DPP gives an advice and say, we have you, there's no case against you, let gentlemen, distinguished senators, let us amend the Constitution to make that power subject to judicial review. So that the people who are aggrieved can go to court with that advice and call for the proof of evidence. And imagine we say, the Attorney General, you are wrong, because this case, as I'm saying, there's prima facie case against these people. Charge them to court. We cannot give the Attorney Generals the power of the judiciary to perform the functions of the judiciary. But let me say that the conditions in section 174 right now, the other scandalous provision there, you put conditions there, but you make them subjective. So, Senator Demelay is correct to the point that these conditions are put there. But do you, the Supreme Court has ruled in several cases that you cannot question the discretion of the Attorney General. So if the Attorney General says, I have looked at it, and those three conditions have been met, the Supreme Court said, well, it is his discretion. They will not even question that discretion. It is wrong. It's wrong. So our concern is replete with mistakes, antiquarian provisions that we must amend. Um, Chief uh, Kiamo, please respond to all the questions they raised, yes, and then 
we call on Senator James Manager to make his uh, comments or ask his questions finally. Just quickly, so I don't exhaust the time. As to the restriction of political parties in the country, my, my humble view is that we must strike a balance between opening up the political space, which, we must, which a democracy allows. We must open up the, the political space to everybody, strike a balance between that and, of course, ensuring that frivolous parties do not put, frivolous parties do not put pressure on the public purse. I, I was the coalition agent for Mr. President at the last election, and by the time they gave us the results sheet, this was like a big wrapper, like the 74 parties, 74 candidates. Some of them did not even have up to 1,000 votes. Some of them had no votes at all in both parts of the country. So how do we allow, and then, IMEC has to now print ballot papers to accommodate them, the ballot paper, and then that's pressure on the public purse. How do we address this? Distinguished senators, I think we can strike a balance by saying, for new parties to be registered, you must show capacity at some small level first before you now come and contest for presidency. Register political parties, fine, but you cannot run for president or senate until you go and run for local government election first, until you win a, a, a councillorship seat. You can reduce it to even one councillorship seat. Until you win a councillorship seat, you cannot run for governorship. Until you win one governorship, you cannot run for Senate. And on and on like that. And so you graduate. They, they, they show capacity to begin to graduate. They show capacity at that level. We can strike a balance by passing this kind of laws to ensure that we all participate in the political process, but we also do not allow all kinds of people to put pressure on the public purse. Now, the questions are so many. Um, distinguished Senator Okpemi Bamidele, my senior in the struggle, my leader and street senior, my leader, political leader and leader in the struggle also, asked the question as why, how we, how we handle activism and governance. I think people don't realize that governance is activism. It's just that because over the years, people have seen politicians as corrupt, as inept, and all that. It's wrong. We have distinguished senators here who are fighting for the rights of their people. They cannot fight for the rights of their people without being here. And I said before that, there's only so much you can do as a private person. Being here, distinguished senators, you know what you are doing. You are fighting for consumer protection. You are passing laws on consumer protection. You are passing laws regarding the rights of the people and how to give them succor. That is activism. Activism is not... I mean, we, are, we have great activists here as senators. I, agree, I mean, that is the truth. Activism is not when you just buy one Android phone and begin to abuse everybody every day. That's not activism. Or activism is not when you begin to burn down vehicles and, and march. That's not activism. Activism is how to bring... You, are, say, you, are, you say you are an activist and you are burning the cars of innocent people on the road. How are you bringing soccer to them? Are those cars belonging to the president that you want to quarrel against? That's stupidity. I apologize. The greatest activists are those in governance. And the greatest activists are people in the legislature. In governance. That is how. Mr. President, two more minutes, two more minutes. And, and quickly as to my philosophy, my philosophy of life, I want to put it very simple, in simple language. I don't want to die without making a loud statement for society and for the poor and the downtrodden. I don't want to die. And that is why I have been, I have been, I have been restless since I was called to the bar. And I'm sure you know that I eventually grew up in front of the nation. Everybody saw me since I was in my, my 20s. I'm almost 50 now. But every single year, I have been restless in fighting for one thing or the other. And everybody watched me grow. The man standing out here, standing here, is that restless young lawyer you used to do many years ago that has grown to become a senior advocate of Nigeria standing here before you. So I grew up before your eyes, virtually. And so I have been restless because I don't want to die without making a loud statement. Time for up, Mr. President. Time for this. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. The single question hasn't been answered. The, should I? Yeah, yeah. Just two minutes. Two minutes. No, you answer. Yeah. Two minutes. Yes. Thank you very much. I ask you that question. On the code of conduct and its provisions, and you know, vis-a-vis the powers, the so-called powers, like you put it, of the presidential panel on recovery of property. property. There's a problem. The problem is that you allow the law to remain in your books. That law was passed in 1984. The law regarding recovery of public property. It was a decree. And when we now, i finish. I'll tie it in. And when we now transited to civil rule, they said all those laws that become acts of parliament. And so that law says the president has powers to set up any panel to recover public property. Let me tell you the difference. Let me tell you the difference. The code of conduct is a constitution, is a constitution did not, no, hold on, sir, with respect, sir, did not criminalize, did not criminalize those provisions regarding the code of conduct. It is that act that now makes it criminal offense. That's the difference. So it's not in conflict. The code of conduct, they will only ban you from public office, ban you from, they will not send you to jail. But that act now makes it a criminal offense. So I am also the lead prosecutor to the panel at some point. I'm the lead prosecutor. And then the Court of Appeal has actually curtailed the powers now. There's a judgment that the Court of Appeal says you cannot charge anybody to court. You can only investigate. And pass your investigation over to the Attorney General for the Attorney General to make a choice. So there's a Court of Appeal judgment. Anything beyond that is abuse of power. Anything beyond that is abuse of power. Is it? 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 Is it?